This is Kevin L. Smith, and I am. Uh, I have the pleasure of being here with Mr. Michael Bulwer Moore, the president and CEO of the International African American Museum. Mr. Moore, thank you for spending some time with us today. Oh, welcome, and, and thank you for the invitation. It's great. Absolutely. So um, we are just we just have a few questions. When I say we, um, it's because I actually have some questions, not only those that I prepared, but also some from the students of oh, great. C.E. Williams Middle School for Creative and Scientific Arts. So um, you'll hear some of their questions, but um, we were just ecstatic to have this opportunity to talk to you and um, just ask you a few questions. Yeah, so. it's, it's my honor, thank you. Absolutely, so we're gonna jump right in. Um, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, like where you're from, your background, um, and your connection to South Carolina. Um, well, I guess it depends on how far you wanna go back. Mm -hmm. um, we understand that um, my first, the first ancestor that I know that, that came to America actually landed on the spot of our museum. Okay. Uh, the former Gadsden's Wharf here on the Cooper River um, back in the late 1780s, we believe. And then um, they ended up down um, in Ladies Island, down mm. near Beaufort. Um, and I've had family on both sides here in South Carolina since then, um, but both my parents left in the 1950s to go to school, to go to college, and uh, they met in Philadelphia. So I was born in Philadelphia. My dad got a teaching job up in Boston. And so I, for the most part, grew up outside of Boston. Okay. But um, deep connection to South Carolina, um, lots of generations of family here. And uh, it's been a blessing to be here and to be able to do the work that I'm doing here in Charleston. And I think we're going to probably a little bit later jump into some more of your connections with South mm -hmm. Carolina and what have you. But I do have a question from one of our learners. Declan D. Uh, would like to ask, what made you want to pursue a political science degree at Syracuse and what made you go to Duke as well? So maybe about your, a little bit about your ec educational background. Yeah. Um, tell us about that. So, um, again, grew up outside of Boston mm -hmm. and um, played lacrosse in high school and had an opportunity to go to Syracuse and play lacrosse there. So if I'm completely honest, that was the motivation that, that got me there. I was looking at some other schools, but you know, Syracuse lacrosse had some sexiness to it uh, that <laughs> right. was attractive to me. Um, but I also had an opportunity, I got a great education uh, there. I, I got a degree from the political science um, school, the Maxwell School, which is perennially rated the number one school in public administration and politics in the country. And so I had amazing experiences with professors and, and just learned a lot. Um, and, um, and then Duke, uh, you know, my, my grandparents, my maternal grandparents lived in Durham. My maternal grandfather was on the board of trustees at Duke. Mm. Um, Duke had a, has a great, MBA school, one of the top schools in marketing, which was the field that I was gravitating toward at the time. And so I guess the combination of all those things, I could, you know, get a great education. I could be near my grandparents as they got older. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact to be, again, quite transparent, they gave me a wonderful package, <laughs> financial aid package. So um, it, it worked out great. Well, there's not, nothing wrong with getting somebody to pay for your education. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with getting somebody else to pay for your education. That's right. Um, so also in your professional background, you've had a lot of positions. And one of those was with Coca-Cola brand. Um, mm -hmm. Abigail D. wants to know a little bit more about how long you managed Coca-Cola brand. And why don't you tell us also about what you did? So yeah. you managed Coca-Cola brand. And, uh, yeah, tell us so, about what that looked like. So I, I, yeah. after Duke, mm -hmm. um, after business school, I went as a junior, I think, assistant brand manager. There's a brand management track. These are marketing people that are focused on the consumer and figuring out how to make the strongest connection between your brand, your product, and consumers. And um, so I started off, and the first two brands that I worked on were Mellow Yellow and Mr. Pibb. Mm. Um, and, uh, and then sort of was promoted up to work on the Coke business. And I worked on that for, you know, two and a half years or so. And it was a phenomenal job. I mean, it was, you know, Coke was and, and still is one of the largest brands in the world and mm -hmm. um, amazing resources. And uh, for me, as someone who is very interested sort of intellectually in marketing and consumer behavior and trying to figure out how and why people uh, make 
sort of purchase decisions and how they create brand affinities. Um, it was just a, a, a fantastic opportunity. And was that, were you in Atlanta? It was in Atlanta, yeah. Atlanta? yeah exactly, yeah. in the early right. 90s. And then, so you before were Before all your students, long before they were born, maybe their parents <laughs> weren't even born. <laughs> Absolutely. So we do want to talk a little bit about another connection that you have as we um, think about your background. Mm -hmm. um, you have a connection to one of the most important people to American history, black history, just in, in the history of, of, of how we have come to be where we are in this country. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that connection to one of your, um, clo your relatives. Yeah, my maternal great-great-grandfather uh, was named Robert Smalls. Mm -hmm. And um, to give you the, the quick story, I mean, he was born in Buford, but at the age of 12 was sent here to Charleston to work and to send his wages back to his master. Fast forward about a decade, he was in his low 20s, he had gravitated toward the water, just had a passion for, for the water, and was a pilot on a boat that had been taken over once the Civil War began by the Confederate Army. It was called the Planter. Mm -hmm. And um, he was married, he had two young children, and like most um, people, obviously married, he has a family, he loves his family, but he knows that as an enslaved person, he really has no sort of control over um, his family. He knows mm -hmm. that his wife and two children could have been sold away at any time. Mm -hmm. And so um, he concocted a plan and he knew that there were some nights that the Confederate crew left the boat not to come back until the next morning. He also knew that just outside the mouth of the harbor, just past Fort Sumter on the Cooper River, out, out the Charleston Harbor, that there was a federal blockade. Mm -hmm. And that if he could get to this blockade, he'd have his freedom. And so again, to make a long story short, on the morning of May 13th, 1862, the Confederate crew left and Robert said this was it, they've gotta go for it. And so. He, um, as the story goes, he put on the top hat and the long overcoat of the Confederate captain, got in the sort of the wheelhouse, um, and at distance, it was two, three o'clock in the morning, and, and again, at distance, um, they couldn't really see him. They saw maybe the light on the, cat, on the hat and the coat, and so they presumed it was the Confederate uh, captain. Robert, because he was the pilot, he knew the passcodes to get past all the forts. There were about five forts that he had to sail past and successfully sort of execute a, the appropriate code. And uh, he did all that and, um, and won his freedom. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came back and actually worked on that very boat for the, the Union now, uh, he became the first African-American to command a United States naval vessel. He was the most senior African-American in the Civil War. He actually convinced President Lincoln to admit formerly enslaved men into the Union Army. Some historians say that that brought in about 200,000 or so um, you know, formerly enslaved men and that that could have made a material difference in the United States prevailing in the Civil War. Um, and then after that, he went back down to Beaufort and was elected to uh, the House and the Senate. And while in the South Carolina legislature in Columbia, he wrote the legislation that created the public school system in South Carolina, the first free compulsory statewide public school system in America, He right here in South Carolina. Mm. And then after that, he, uh, he went to Congress and he was uh, elected uh, and served five terms longer than any other African American during that brief period of Reconstruction. And the end, he came back as Reconstruction was sort of being dismantled. And as uh, uh, you know, Jim Crow was sort of rearing its head, he came back and was the collector of customs in Beaufort and, uh, and then passed in 1915. Mm. So there was a part of the story of Robert Smalls I found to be very fascinating, um, actually, which is, when he came back to Buford, I believe, mm -hmm. he bought the house, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the big house, so mm -hmm. to speak. So mm -hmm. maybe you can tell us what is the, the big house. And, and then there was a story about the uh, former uh, lady of the house yeah, coming yeah. back um, and him taking care of her, even though at one yeah, point he yeah. was enslaved. Yeah, he, um, there's real poetry to this part of his, his life. Um, so by delivering the planter to the United States government, to the Union, um, and by the way, it was full of munitions and guns and, and the like, and so it was very valuable. He got a reward. He didn't get what 
Congress prescribed in those situations, I guess they couldn't see fit to give a black man that kind of money, to be frank about it. But he got a reward, and um, two things he did. The first thing he did, you know, as a youngster, he education was so important to him, and it was important in part because it was denied him. Mm -hmm. You know, as an enslaved person, it was illegal for him to be taught to read and write. And so the first thing he did was he hired tutors. And at five o'clock in the morning and then in the evening, he would have these tutors teaching him how to read and write and, um, and, and giving him the education that had been denied him for so long. But the other thing that he did, the big thing that he did, was he went back and he bought not just the big house, which is the house that his master and their family lived in, but he bought the plantation that his mother had been enslaved on. Mm. So, you know, in a real reverse of fates, you know, here is this person formerly enslaved, formerly considered a piece of property, mm -hmm. essentially, on this, you know, on this land in this house, coming back and buying the house that he had been enslaved in. And then there is a really interesting story. Um, after the Civil War, um, as the story goes, his former master had passed, had died, and his, uh, his master's wife came back and she was both mentally and physically ill. Mm -hmm. And she thought she was coming back to her house. She'd finally gotten back to Beaufort. She made her way to 511 Prince Street and, and you know, sort of knocked on the door and tried to get in and, and there's Robert. And, um, and Robert, you know, and again, you know, he had been enslaved. He had been owned by this woman, mm -hmm. but he embraced her, he brought her in, he took care of her throughout the remaining years of her life. He even allowed her to live in the master bedroom, you know, what mm -hmm. she thought was her bedroom. Um, now it was his house. And, um, and even though she wouldn't eat at the dinner table with him, Robert continued to offer um, you know, sort of the accommodations and, and treatment like it was her house. So I, I think for me, it just speaks to the enormous uh, sort of humanity in this yeah. person. Um, and so, yeah, it was an amazing story. Yeah, I don't know how many people actually could could uh, do that yeah. or, or take that opportunity yeah. to, to, to and, and exact I, revenge, so to speak. Yeah, and in a world, you know, today, for example, that's so mm -hmm. polarized mm -hmm. that has, you know, these everybody kind of at each other's throats. I mean, I think there's a message there. There's a, yeah. there's a lesson there about, um, you know, trying to hold on to the humanity of a situation and doing the right thing by that, so. Yeah, you know. it's interesting with, what, what, uh, what you can do or what you do with power and how yeah. that affects other people. Yeah. They're very good, it's very interesting. Um, so, in the grand scheme of things, I, I would like to ask this question, which is, why do you believe black history is so important to American history, and why is it important to continue to celebrate black history? I think a lot of reasons. Um, you know, if you care about and know about George Washington and Ben Franklin and Paul Revere, then you gotta also know about Harriet Tubman and Denmark Vesey and Robert Smalls. I mean, it's, it's all our history. It's American history. It's a part of the American story. Now, it's a, it's a part of the narrative that hasn't gotten the kind of volume and the kind of place in the narrative that it deserves, mm -hmm. but it's our history. And so, you know, from my standpoint, um, I am doing this work in large part for two reasons. One, to finally pay homage to all those who sacrificed everything. You know, we talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They sacrificed everything, including all of that, in service to someone else's greed and, mm -hmm. and search for, for, you know, for money, essentially, mm -hmm. which is what slavery was about. And so it's finally time that we'll be able to pay appropriate homage and respect to their sacrifices, to their contributions in building this country. But the second piece of that is it's, it's, it's for them mm -hmm. as well. I mean, it's, it's for children. I've got four youngsters, four sons. Mm -hmm. And I think often that it's, it's important that our young people have an opportunity to walk in a wall, particularly our African-American young people, mm -hmm. walk in a museum and see people who have done amazing things. Mm -hmm. You know, just just amazing things in helping to build this country, helping to create the world that we live in, and but that those people also look like them mm -hmm. and therefore hopefully um, act as inspiration that 
hey, you know, here's somebody who's from here who did these great things. Maybe I can do it too. So there's an inspirational aspect of what we're doing that, that I think is important as well. So speaking of the museum, um, I, I do want you to talk to us a little bit about uh, what the, the aims and the goals are of the museum. And it's also interesting, um, this is not the South Carolina African American mm -hmm. Museum uh, or, you know, the Charleston mm -hmm. um, African American, but it's the International African American Museum. What, why the word international as we set forth with um, the, the, this endeavor yeah, to it's create a, it's, this museum? It's a great question. Yeah. Um, Charleston has always been an international city. It's an international port. And as the epicenter of the slave trade, I mean, the site of our museum is where more enslaved Africans landed, arrived, and were sold than any other place in America throughout the entire course of the transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was the capital, Charleston was the capital of slavery, to, to put it another way. And there's a whole international aspect to that, to the, to the slave trade. You know, a lot of the boats were financed and came from Liverpool, England, mm -hmm. went down to Africa, picked up the cargo, the human cargo there, went to the Caribbean, came here, brought rum back, brought, I mean, there was a, there was a whole international aspect to the business of slavery that we talk about. The other thing is, um, you know, we want to, add dimension to who the people were who came here. There's kind of this unspoken um, and, and erroneous kind of a, a assumption that it was the people who came here were somehow just this monolithic race of, of slaves. I don't even use that word, enslaved mm. people. Mm. Um, and they weren't. There were people who came from just hundreds of different cultures with different languages and, and food traditions and faiths. And, and so we want to talk about that. Then we want to talk about where the people went. We know that people after the Revolutionary War, some of the enslaved Africans left and went to Nova Scotia, for example. And we know that a good chunk of those people then left and went to found Freetown in Sierra Leone, which was the first um, city founded by freed, formerly enslaved folks, you know, in the, in the world. Mm. Um, there's a lot of connections between um, here, the diaspora is, is far and wide and we want to shed light on that. So the international piece um, acknowledges this broader um, kind of connection. It, it acknowledges the diaspora. It seeks to identify and, and sort of add dimension to the people who came here and, and sort of position Charleston uh, in the kind of international uh, way that it certainly was. One of the things that's interesting, you know, I didn't know until I got involved in this project that Charleston was the richest city in America mm -hmm. for over a hundred years. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not that old mm -hmm. um, as a nation, but for a hundred years, Charleston was the richest city. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, it, it speaks to Charleston and its position in the world, and we, we want to acknowledge and, and talk about that. Yeah. Wow. Um, so Caitlin G. and Matthew C. I put their questions together because they uh, have a really good question, which is, what are the timelines for the museum? Like, when will it break ground? Well, when will it open to the it's, public? It's a great question. It's a great question. So, we um, look to go to city council to get approval to proceed with construction sometime in February, the end of February, well, let's say. Of this year? Of this year. Okay. And then we hope to actually break ground, hopefully late spring, early summer of this year. Mm. And then it's about a two-year construction cycle. It'll take about, um, I don't know, six months or so prepping the land and getting, you know, sort of putting the plumbing and the electrical and all that. Mm -hmm. And then they'll build, it'll take about a year to build, and then it'll take about six months once the building is completed to populate it with the exhibits and sort of get it ready for opening. So it's about a two-year construction cycle. So we're looking, you know, late spring, early summer 2021 for the opening. Okay. Um, Bailey D. wants to know, how much money will it take to build the museum? That's a great question, <laughs> Bailey D. Bailey D. Um, <laughs> so it looks like it's uh, it's going to take over a hundred million dollars. The the and and um, it's in, been sort of in different buckets. The land cost about twenty five million dollars. We've been blessed to get um, twenty five million dollars from both the city and the county. We got twenty five million dollars committed from the state, and we've raised about thirty million. 35 million dollars 
um, in private philanthropy, and we're continuing to raise money um, to, to close that out. So it's it's not an inexpensive, uh, you know, concept. No, it's, it, it's, it's a little bit more um, than, than the average house, Yeah, let's say that. Um, Tanner H. and Noah R. want to know what are some of the types of features that the museum will include? Like, what are some things that will be, be in there? Well, it, it's going to be a very special place. Um, two sides of the museum, on the east side facing the water. And by the way, this is, um, if, if any of your students will know, it's, it's just a little bit south of the aquarium, okay. right next to the Maritime Center. There's an open lot there, right on the water. It'll be long and thin. And um, it's raised 14 feet off the ground, in part out of sort of respect and deference to the sanctity of the ground underneath it. Again, the spot where we're building the museum is where almost half of all the enslaved Africans who came to America landed. So it's very powerful, you know, sacred kind of a space. And we're going to sort of interpret that space um, at the ground level. And so there'll be gardens. Uh, there'll be sort of installations on the gr at the ground level. It'll be almost like a public park where even if the museum is closed, the park will always be open. You can go and you can read sort of interpretations about the history there. We'll um, talk about the historical water line, which is different than the actual water line now. They've built land on, and so the, the water line now is in considerably. Um, you know, there was a lot of history on the site that we'll okay. sort of interpret. And then you'll go in the building in the middle, and then you could go in either east or, or west um, way. And, and um, the east side will have um, galleries that will be sort of deep dives into specific content. So there'll be something about South Carolina. There'll be a big um, table that will be like a computer screen that you can yeah. touch screen. You can touch and manipulate, and you can... Um, if you see something that's interesting, you could sort of pull it to you, open it up, press a button, and it'll play. Um, talking about different history in South Carolina. So some interactive. It, it's interactive, absolutely yeah. interactive. Yeah, if, yeah. if you want to know more, you can put in an email address and email information to you. Um, so that, that'd be great. There'll be a gallery on Gullah Geechee culture. Mm -hmm. There'll be a gallery on rice. Rice was America's original cash crop. It's what created that enormous wealth that I talked about here in Charleston before, so we'll talk about that. And, you know, the, the Rice Gallery is, is really important because I think, again, there was a misnomer um, that enslaved folks who came here that it was all about sort of brute labor, and it, mm -hmm. it was about that. But there was no rice industry in this country until people largely from Sierra Leone, Western Africa, came and brought with them the know-how, sort of technology even, of how to leverage the tides, the lunar cycles with the inflows of water to flood these rice fields and the like. And it, it, was, it was technology, and um, so we'll talk about that. Uh, there's a gallery about Africa, talking about where these people came from. There's a broader gallery that sort of is a nod to the question about international, that's showing kind of the international connectivity um, and, and Charleston's sort of place and role in the international piece. So um, on that east side, deep dives into specific content. On the west side, there'll be a long sort of walk that will be sort of linear, a linear presentation of the history. So you'll start with the first um, enslaved Africans to come here. Um, most people think it's 1619. It was, that was the date when the British, when folks came with the British, but there were Africans right. here in the 1500s with the Spanish, and so we'll talk about those folks. Mm. And you'll walk along, and you will eventually come to the present. And so it's a it's a presentation of, of, of our history. There'll be a temporary exhibit gallery in the middle of that, and every year, a couple times a year, we'll trade out and bring in new content to keep it fresh. One of the things that will be really powerful, though, we've got a Center for Family History. Okay. And the Center for Family History will be a, a tool, a place where people can go and get help in finding, really exploring their own family history and helping to piece together the pieces of their family tree. And then with DNA testing can actually, we'll be able to point to wherever people's DNA comes from. So it'll be a place, you know, the, the whole museum will be um, 
sort of telling this broad story about African American history, but the Center for Family History will be a place where people can find their own personal strand mm -hmm. of that history. And so I think that's going to be a very powerful place. So lots of interesting, lots of interactive kinds of engagement. There'll be, I think, 31 media installations, um, screens of a variety of different kinds showing different content. In one gallery, there'll be an enormous floor to ceiling screen that will be, I don't know, maybe 30 feet long floor to ceiling screens okay. that will you know be great so it's it's going to be it's going to be uh, fun it's going to be engaging um, we're going to tell the truth about history yeah. and in that way there you know obviously there is some difficult history that that we'll tell but we'll be honest about that um, but ultimately we hope people will walk out feeling inspired feeling um, uplifted by stories of, of perseverance, of strength, and of accomplishment. And, and again, it's, it's an American story right. um, that I think all Americans will resonate with and, and will, uh, will appreciate. I, I'm already like, all right, sign me up. I'm on the <laughs> way. Um, so you, 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 you talked about just now the resilience of, of individuals. And, um, we obviously talked about your great great grandfather um, and what he did and what he accomplished. And of course, I, I know that it took a lot of courage and the mm -hmm. resilience of those who, unfortunately, you know, experienced slavery. And I think some people may think, you know, of the time of slavery and oppression and those things as like it was one day and then it was over the next day, not realizing that there were generations mm -hmm. of individuals who were born and died. Yeah. As, as you know, deemed to be property of ins yeah. as, as enslaved people. Um, but, but I wanna know, it, it, with all of the resilience that individuals have had to experience, I wanna know a little bit more about, about you and your resilience, and, mm. um, because I think it's really important as we talk to individuals who are leading strong and powerful work and challenging work to know what it is that drives them. So, um, Alma A. wanted to know what words would you use to describe your journey with um, the International African American Museum thus far? Mm. Um, and then that's going to roll into some other questions that I have as well. Yeah, thank you, Alma. It's, it's a great question. It is, um, so I, I've had a blessed life. Uh -huh. um, just, let's take the personal aside and just think professionally. I mean, I, I ran the largest brand in the world. I was president of a software company that created the first, was really a pioneer in creating what we all now know as social media. You know, I was vice president of marketing for the hottest sports apparel uh, brand company in the world at the time. Um, I, I've, I've had a lot of fun. I've had a blessed career. This is by far the most important work that I've ever done. Um, you know, to have an opportunity to create this museum on the spot that's so important, um, to tell these stories, to commemorate this history, um, and, in, and here in Charleston, because again, this was where so much of that history happened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're creating, it's rare that a relatively small city like Charleston has an opportunity to create something that's really a gift to the nation. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're building. We're building something that we hope people from all around the country and all around the world will come visit to. We, we've done some of the genealogical work and we believe that there's a greater than 99% probability that all living African Americans, wherever you are in the country right now, all living African Americans have at least one relative who came from Charleston. So it's that commonplace. It's very different than Ellis Island where people came looking for new opportunity. It's very, very different. But it is that one place where we can, people of African descent can look to, uh, that that's where their first American ancestors took their first steps. And so we hope to create a sense of pilgrimage that people will want to come back and connect with that history and with those original sort of ancestors. So it is, um, it's important work, it's difficult work. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in, in a host of ways. Um, it's, it's particularly challenging for me because I'm not a museum professional yet. I'm building a museum. I'm responsible for building a museum. But I have the most amazing team of people who are museum professionals and who have enormous capabilities and experience who've come, who've, who have committed their careers to come and make this uh, a very, very special place. And uh, and so, you know, we are working hard and we are very diligent about making this happen. Very good. 
So you, of, of course, with this work and the money, the amounts of money you have to raise, I'm, I'm sure that it takes you around the country, maybe even around the world, mm -hmm. to talk about the I, I, um, IAAM. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're, I'm sure, meeting people you don't know, mm -hmm. meeting people who need to hear the story, know if they want to invest in it. But as you're doing that, because you've obviously done a lot of work to be able to do that and, and meet with these diverse groups, what have you found to be the skills that have been necessary to help you to do that, to tell the story and to compel individuals to invest um, monies into it? Yeah, another great, great question. I mean, I think what has helped me, a couple things. One is I have enormous passion for this project. It's, not, it's, it's more than just a job. Someone recently said, yeah, it's kind of like a calling for you. It is, it's a calling. And so with that, commitment comes a level of passion which I think people are able to read and see mm -hmm. and I think that's important I think my um, personal connection I talked about Robert Smalls I have others here um, in Charleston um, so that that people know that um, my connection is is deep it's real there's integrity to it uh, it's not just a kind of quick business opportunity um, mm -hmm. they see the, the connection and then I think, you know, I've been able to pull together an amazing team, as I just mentioned, and people see, wow, you're bringing in the person who really was instrumental in helping to build the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And, mm -hmm. you know, she's now here, and you're able to get this person who, you know, is, is, had this amazing job at this museum, and that person. And so I think people, you know, see that. And then I think above and beyond all of that, people are resonating with the history. Mm -hmm. and with the story of, of our museum. Again, that we're building this museum you know, on this very, very important, sacred spot, place. Um, you know, Lonnie Bunch, speaking of, mm -hmm. of the Smithsonian, you mm -hmm. know, he's the executive director of the Smithsonian African American Museum. He says that there are you know, very, very few sacred places of African American history in the entire hemisphere, but that the former Gadsden's Wharf, where we're building our museum, is one of them. Mm -hmm. So even he recognizes, he, he also has, has told us that, you know, I've got this big museum in D.C., there's a lot of Charleston here, but if y'all don't commemorate appropriately that history there, it kind of undercuts what he's trying to do in telling that story. So the stories are important. Um, the history is important for a variety of different reasons. We've got an amazing team. And I've got to also mention, I mean, former Mayor Joe Riley, who really came up with the idea in the year 2000 and has really been just staunchly behind this in, in, in his retirement. You know, he deserves to kind of put up his feet and kind of relax now. He's working full time to help make this happen. And people resonate with his commitment as well. And I did, I've had a chance to spend some time with um, Lonnie Bunch when he came in town. He was here a couple of years yeah. ago, and I still haven't made it to that museum, but um, but moving on, uh, it, I think that the power of what you said about everyone else recognizing the, the, the historical um, place of Charleston, mm -hmm. it is definitely yeah. um, uh, incumbent upon us um, to, to celebrate that ourselves. So, um, but you talked about your team, and of course, as we're, we're talking, um, a lot of young people are going to see this, so I want to Ask you, what are the skills um, that you're looking for in those who you want to bring on the team? Of course, they have impressive resumes from what you said, but they also have to have a certain skill set. So what would you be looking for, um, not only with this, with this endeavor, mm -hmm. but also in those other uh, professional endeavors that you've been a part of? What are you looking for? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, people who are bright, who are curious, who... Um, you know, who have kind of inquiring minds, who are not afraid to sort of think and to process information and to, to uh, you know, the world sometimes creates a box that it, most people sort of live in and those people who are able to sort of understand that, understand those parameters, but then think outside of that box and think beyond that box, that's where, you know, amazing things happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I personally resonate with, with that. Um, you know, people need to be able to communicate well, to be able to speak, to write. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a commitment, hard work, a lot of hard work, being able to be comfortable rolling up your sleeves mm -hmm. and, and working kind of all hours. I was up this morning at 3.30 in the morning. 
Um, I don't do that every morning, <laughs> but this morning I was up, you know, then because I had stuff on my mind and I had to get things done, and um, and sometimes you know it, it, it takes that. So, um, but I think the the broader um, advice I would give, not that you asked, but no, no, you know, I would good. counsel people yeah. is to uh, to just think broadly about, you know, to really get in touch with what is it that they love to do? What is it that really sort of turns them on um, about the world? And figure out a way to develop a skill set that they can um, then monetize at the appropriate point. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I grew up maybe not too dissimilar from you with the advice, oh, just do what you're passionate about and the money will follow. And I think the world is a little bit more complex now. Yeah. But figure out what is it that you love to do and that you can also help to put food on your table mm -hmm. and, and look for that intersection. And, um, and just don't be, don't be afraid to work hard. Don't be afraid to uh, reach out to people to ask questions. Um, you know, all the folks that are on TV here, I am, if you email me at mbmore at iaamuseum.org, mbmore, M-O-O-R-E, at iaamuseum.org, I'll email you back. But you got to reach out. And don't be afraid to, to, to do that. And, um, you know, reach out to people, ask questions, um, and the world will... Uh, will will come to you mm -hmm. um, your your ideas your, your things will come to you if that makes any sense yeah it, it does it does basically uh, think outside the box don't be afraid to work hard yeah. find what it is that you love to do yeah. and uh, not be afraid to do the hard work that yeah. it takes to yeah and reach out and connect and ask and connect. for advice seek out mentors absolutely um, yeah and and I think again that's MB more at IAAM museum IAA Museum. IAA Museum. Dot org. Dot org. Yes, sir. Got it. So, Tynasia S. had a, a question, and uh, I think you kind of answered it, but if you want to add to to this, um, to what you said, what keeps you motivated to continue to engage in, in such challenging work? I can only imagine that uh, there's nothing um, right now except for a plan and obviously some money that you've raised, and, and I'm sure that it can be a daunting task. Mm -hmm. You've obviously conquered some of those before, mm -hmm. but what is keeping you motivated? Well, I feel an enormous responsibility to this project, mm -hmm. um, to the people here in Charleston, particularly the African American community here in Charleston. I feel an enormous responsibility to our ancestors um, to create this institution, as I mentioned, that will finally pay respect and homage to their sacrifices and contributions. Uh, I, 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 it's, this is a once in a beyond a once in a lifetime kind of a kind of an opportunity and so what motivates me is getting it right mm. is getting the stories right getting the experience right building the appropriate relationships in our community um, to figure out how to engage in ways that add value you know we're one of the aspects of our museum is that you know a lot of times you think of a museum you just kind of walk in look around and then leave well we're creating an institution that that's the start but that's not the end um, we're going to engage with people online. We will likely engage with many times more people on our website than we'll have a chance to come visit. We're creating all kinds of educational programs. We got a grant not too long ago um, that will help to fund school trips um, from around the state and the region of schools that kids who might otherwise not have a chance to come here, but to come here to, to experience this. Um, you know, we're building, uh, you know, curricula to share with principals like you and teachers like like yours um, to help support them teaching this history. We're going to have residency programs for st teachers from all around the country to come to help learn this history because it's not always taught um, you know uh, effectively so. It's going to be a vibrant active place. There'll be uh, movie and documentary showings, there'll be lectures, there'll be um, symposia, there'll be all kinds of things happening at the museum and uh, I, I am focused on the opportunity and uh, humbled by uh, the challenge. Let's so, say. And, and you, you mentioned and I believe that I had some of our young people ask and um, many of them, will young people have the opportunity 
to volunteer, um, actually that was Sydney G, as will students be able to volunteer at the museum? Yeah, I mean, volunteers are going to be very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, there are some museums around, I think the aquarium has hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. We're going to have um, lots of volunteers, there'll be lots of opportunities for young people to get involved. I think the thing that I would offer now, I mean, lots of your young people will have phones and be active on social media and hopefully they'll see this and hopefully they'll be inspired by it in some way to just pass the word, talk about the museum, um, tell your friends that it's coming and that it's, it's going to be cool and you saw this guy on this video. And, <laughs> um, just spread the word because um, you know, it's important. That's, that's a way that today some people can help. Absolutely. Well, I know that time is very precious for you. Um, we just have uh, only a few more minutes before we can um, take care of this within the time, and I want to honor that. Um, but before we do that, I do have a little bit of C.E. Williams swag for you. So, you know, as you are waking up at 3.30 in the morning, if, you, if you're a coffee drinker, um, right. tea or what have you, here's a C.E. Williams you. middle school mug for you. Wonderful. And just because we want you to know that you are a part of our school community, as you are a part of the Charleston community. Uh, here's a C.E. Williams oh, uniform wonderful. shirt. So All you right. are now a part of the learning community. Thank you. Um, this is you wonderful. A part of the Ohana. I know that's Hawaiian and not African American uh, history, but um, when we, we say that, it's about making sure that nobody gets left behind and nobody yeah. gets yes, forgotten. Sir. And I appreciate you that's making right. sure that those who um, came to mm -hmm. Charleston and came to this country aren't getting aren't getting forgotten. Yeah. Um, so we do appreciate it. Michael Bowler Moore. Um, thank you for so much for your time. Thank you. Thank um, you. It's been and, great. And just again, and so young people remember he gave you his email address, and so I'm sure that we'll be able to share that. But connections are really important. Listen to the things that were said and shared, um, but most of all, also remember that um, Black history is is American history. Absolutely. So thank yes, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.